Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest. Now, I've been holding him in reserve for a long, long time because I, I just know I can come down to his office and he's going to be absolutely brilliant. Um, he's Mark Littlewood, the director of the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is just like one of the best things in the world, Mark. Well done. Well, well done for running a, a, a decent crew of happy warriors. Well, thank you, James, and thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, it is our job to be happy warriors and spread a bit of happiness and uh, a bit of light um, rather than heat and uh, a bit of clear thinking rather than muddled thinking. So uh, I'm in the happy position that I love my job, love my company, um, love the people I work with, love the cause that I'm supporting. I was thinking you should bring out a range of cigarette cards with, or maybe top trumps even, mm-hmm. you know, so you have Nimitz, the, the tank commander, von Nimitz probably, um, with his special skills at kind of, Winding up commies. Yeah. And uh, then, uh, in Top Trumps, you have these categories. Yeah. Don't you? So you get your wind up commie rating. You know, yeah. You know, you know, Christian would be sort of 99 Christian's out of 100. Christian's pretty good. That. He goes there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you've got Kate, who's just like Kate, the, the secret weapon against the feminists. Yes, that's true as because well. Because she's a woman. Yeah. Which really, really helps. Because yeah. you can't talk about the gender pay, pay gap being bollocks without being a woman, really. I think that's exactly right. Uh, it, one of the big interesting issues for the IA is actually uh, the variety of tone and the range of different voices we have. So we have some people who are deadly serious and uh, make their points in a very academic way. We have others who are light-hearted. We have people we can credibly field on issue X, others who are much stronger on issue Y. Um, so maybe you're right. I actually maybe need a series of top trumps of my staff to actually make sure that we're we're getting everybody to argue the right things and playing to their comparative advantages. It's exactly what Adam Smith would have advised. Well, exactly. Well, we are, are we not, increasingly beleaguered. I mean, I look around me, and I need, before we started this podcast, you said you wanted to talk about how everyone whinges too much and how nobody's bright and uplifting. And I said, well, actually, we on the right, whatever you want to, however you want to define us, we are actually happy warriors and, we are, and, we're, and we're, we're much better at the snark and the fun than the other side. The left can't mean we can. But that said, let me whinge briefly, which is that I find it almost impossible now to read, read the newspapers, even, even notionally conservative newspapers. Mm-hmm. I can't watch the BBC anymore. It is just so completely on board with the kind of cultural Marxist programme that it's just like being fed propaganda. Yeah. Um, and obviously, if, you're, if you earn your living as a journalist, stuff that I, I reckon I could have written very happily and got published 10, 15 years ago, I'm now considered so out there so extreme that they pretty much don't run my stuff anymore. And I'm not whinging about this because I've got Breitbart and, and I've, got, I've got places like Die Welt Vodka and The Spectator. Sure. But it is increasingly hard for journalists to, and I, I think about the younger generation particularly, how they can make a living from their pens espousing the kind of politics that, that we all believe in, right. like, like free markets and... Sure. But, I, I mean, isn't it the case that the if you like, the range of acceptable opinions and views in the mainstream media has narrowed radically. Totally. But the market will always find a way. What this is in part um, uh, maybe a reflection of or maybe a cause of is that, um, you know, back in the day, everybody would have tuned in to the BBC six o'clock news yeah. for their daily update of what's happening and what to think or, um, or certainly what's happening. Now... You have a plethora of different platforms. So you're saying, you know, bright part or whatever. Um, so in my view, I'm less worried about the mainstream media parroting an incredibly sort of narrow establishment line um, or even a culturally Marxist one because your ability to get news and opinions from elsewhere is radically enhanced. And the barriers to entry have just collapsed. I mean, I, I don't want to talk too much about internal IEA business, but I was looking at um, 
uh, free view channels. You know, I mean, but back when I were a kid, it was just incredibly exciting when Channel Four launched, and I now had a you know use of button number four on my remote control. Now, I mean, I I could have probably only list less than half of the channels that I have on my uh, TV. And apparently, to hire a free view channel for a year, I mean, I think you would be sort of channel number. 572 or something mm -hmm. only cost fifty thousand pounds there or thereabouts so you can now launch your own television station platform for 50 grand a year i mean you'll need to buy the kit and pay presenters and produce content yeah, yeah. but this is an unbelievable collapse in barriers to where would that media. so if i wanted to buy a free view uh, I, I, and i'm quite tempted i mm -hmm. must say well obviously when i get get my donors how much censorship would 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 you be under you would be under Ofcom guidelines, right? So well, there you are, uh, you my understanding of it is that you could not launch a um, hardcore pornography channel, for example. Uh, you would be under this typical advertising restrictions that apply. Um, but, you know, Russia Today broadcasts, um, and I, I dare say they get endless threats and complaints and everything else, and I'm not applauding their editorial slant. But if Russia Today can broadcast on it, it's not obvious to me that Dellingpol Today couldn't. What, so, so you could have this, I like the sound of this already, Dellingpol Today, or just Dellingpol Channel. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't have to have balance or anything like that. There's, there, there, there's no legislation on that. Well, I, I think that hinges actually on whether you are a news channel um, uh, or whether you are a comment channel. And again, what's breaking down really for the regulators here? Uh, is again, back in the day when you were able to say, right, there are essentially two television stations, BBC One and ITV, what is commercial, what is public, this is how they're both regulated. Yeah. It is now becoming hazier and hazier to work out what fits into what category. So I don't think they could stop you running equivalents of comment shows. Sky put on comment shows with the sort of five people sitting around a table chewing the fat. Clearly, if you started to broadcast things which were manifestly untrue, or you only ever oh. gave wind to one side of the argument, yeah, you might walk into... But you see, there, 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 there you are. Uh, you, you've put your finger on the problem. That the, the left's definition of manifestly untrue, for example, if you tell the truth about climate change... Sure. On YouTube now, you get a, a pretty little note directing you to the Wikipedia page explaining that you're all wrong. Yeah. The BBC has has declared that no more will it give any space to climate climate skeptics, despite you know having people like uh, Professor Richard Lindzen mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. from MIT uh, on the skeptical side of the argument. Apparently, he's not good enough. Whereas Michael sure. Mann, the multiply discredited creator of the, the hockey stick, is. Um, so it. As soon as you get an organisation like Ofcom, which which is in a position to decide what is true and untrue, then you become vulnerable to the system of censorship. So I'm, I worry about this. No, I think you're right. And uh, I was just giving an indication, rather than career advice to you, to raise your £50,000 yeah. set up telling TV. Because, of course, what will really happen is this is a reflection of actually being a number on a TV channel being increasingly less important than simply broadcasting your opinions over your podcast or over your website or whatever else. Yeah. And at that point, you are uh, beyond the reach of Ofcom to all intents and purposes. I mean, again, to give you an example, not a particularly political one, uh, I'm interested in um, sports. I'm a, um, a particular fan of uh, English football, but I also love American football, NFL. And in order to watch that, I buy for about 100 quid a year a package over the internet which broadcasts every NFL game, which I then just plug into my television and I watch my favourite team. I bought that package from the States. Uh, now, there's nothing particularly untoward about that. What's interesting, however, is during the commercial breaks, I'm watching advertisements which are regulated and acceptable to an American audience, but not regulated by British advertising standards. Now, they're not enormously different. Yeah. They're not radically different. I mean, but for example, in America, you're allowed to advertise on television um, pharmaceutical products that you can only get on prescription. That's prohibited in the United Kingdom. You, right. can, only, you can only advertise pharmaceutical products that you can get over the counter. Um, you know, supposing uh, in the UK, we were decided that we were going to ban, I don't know, all McDonald's, Burger King and fast food and confectionery adverts after nine o'clock at night. Well, this doesn't apply to my NFL.com feed 
over the internet and what the hell are the advertising standards agency going to do about it? So, look, I think you're right to say that culturally there is this sort of, I was going to say race to the middle, I'm not really sure it's that, but the, the mainstream media have an incredibly narrow uh, and collective sense of what is right and wrong. But on the upside, and you started this by saying let's be optimistic, happy mm. warriors, mm. it is considerably more difficult for um, your activities to be regulated. So it might be that 30 or 40 years ago, you would have written for the Daily Telegraph and would have been an occasional pundit on BBC Question Time or something. Yeah. And that would have been the sum total of what you could have achieved. And you would still have been under some restrictions about what you could say on those platforms. Here and now, your only limit is how, much, how many people you can sell your journalism to for how much. That has to be a step in the right direction. Oh, totally. No, I think that the internet has been transformative for freedom of expression and it's freed voices like mine from being constrained by gatekeepers to a degree. The problem is the left knows this and the left is in charge of the whole of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So this is why they're trying to close down. I mean, they'd love to close down Breitbart. I mean, it'd be fantastic because Breitbart was the, the only news channel that got behind Trump Sure. When everyone else was saying he was just hopeless. Yeah, yeah. And now they're looking kind, kind of quite clever. But there are lots of people who think it's evil. I mean, on, on the left, obviously, sure. and who think it's, it's fake news, yeah. even. But good luck. I mean, I would say good luck closing that down. Now, again, if you wanted to be a pessimist rather than an optimist, an unhappy warrior rather than a happy one, you would look at info wars being taken offline, effectively, recently. Alex yeah. Jones is sort of rather hysterical con- conspiracy stuff. And I, I hold no torch for, for him or some of his madder views. But it is true that I think almost collectively these sort of Silicon Valley platforms at roughly three o'clock in the morning one night took him off mm. uh, each platform. So listen, the new technologies do not mean that censorship either by the law or by editorial discretion is impossible. But it makes it a damn sight harder. Mm. And if, uh, and I'm not suggesting they would go down this path, but yeah. if... YouTube decided that you could only post videos of a centre-left or hard-left opinion, they would very swiftly be placed, replaced by a different platform. The well, I mean, that's, that's, that's what they've done, though, pretty much. I mean, they've demonetized anything that's not, not on the left. Well, then uh, it, it is incumbent upon some techie kid in his garage who wants to make a billion dollars yeah, yeah. to set up a platform that is going to appeal to... Uh, folk of your and my political persuasion and such a person would be very rich and it probably only requires two kids in a garage to set it up. Well, that's that's the theory, certainly, but nothing has really cropped up that has replaced YouTube. I mean, I, I agree. Look, there's a difference between theory and reality and we've both read our Hayek. Mm-hmm. We both, mm-hmm. we like Mises and people mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. don't we? And we believe in the markets. We have faith. But actually, there is another force which wants to get away of the market and that's the state. And or, or its manifestations in, sure. in, in forms like Silicon Valley. And I, I mean, this to me is the great clash of our times, and maybe it always was the great clash. I think that's right. And the, I think actually it's incumbent upon people of our sort of Hayekian free market persuasion uh, to probably do a bit more to call out crony capitalism. That yes. when you have got uh, major incumbent companies, and when you have a state that passes huge and complex reams of regulations and tax exemptions. Uh, You have a scenario in which uh, barriers to entry are likely to be raised. And and that is a situation which I think is getting worse, simply because the regulatory and tax landscape is now impossible for a single human being to navigate. Uh, You just cannot know the entirety of the British tax code, you certainly, uh, you know, if you're running any sort of complex business at all, need a whole raft of regulatory compliance officers. Compliance officers probably the biggest growing um, area of employment in the... I think it's 10% of the US economy. That, that, and that was about five years ago when Mark Stein wrote his book, America, uh, America Alone. And, and of course, you know, it's not to suggest necessarily wickedness on the part of the participants here. This is, I think, one of the key understandings of public choice theory. They are just following their incentives. So if you are a major player in the market uh, and you have the ability 
to um, A, comply with the rules and B, ensure that they are not softened or weakened to allow other people to enter the market. You are going to do that. So a big state that has huge numbers of regulators, that has the power to radically change or even just tweak the rules around what constitutes legitimate and independent broadcasting, what tax breaks do you have for producing A, B, C, D or E, will, as night follows day, entirely rationally, lead to big companies being crony capitalists who spend an awful lot of their time making sure that the rules stay the way they want them. Yeah. But the solution here to crony capitalism, I think, is to call it out when one sees it. But because the state is so powerful, lobbying, in effect, is going to be an extremely important profession. And sometimes we caricature this as the lobbyists are the bad guys, but it's actually an entirely rational way to react to a very, very, very powerful state. You would be nuts if you were YouTube and were not um, concerned night and day about what rules impact on content or what might come down the road and hit you, and you would employ huge numbers of people to be compliant. It's not just in the media that this happens. One area where we have totally lost uh, over the last 10 years any sense of rendering the zeitgeist or the move music something approaching reality is on banking and financial services. Uh, it's absolutely staggering that people consider this sector to be a Wild West, unregulated sector. Yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, I gather if you were to look back at how many regulators, I'm not even measuring compliance officers who work for companies here, just regulators of banking in 1980. Look at the trajectory right the way up to the banking crisis in 2008. Massive upwards trajectory. Plot that trajectory onwards to uh, the year about 2065, I think is the crossover point. By 2065, we will have more regulators than we have people working in financial services. Every single person in financial services will have their own personal regulator yes. on their shoulders. That's the trajectory. And um, unfortunately, we have not been able to communicate that the world has moved in that direction, uh, did not prevent the collapse of the banks, is continuing to move in that direction. And what we have is anything but a unregulated devil take behind most free market liberal economy. We have a very, very highly, heavily regulated economy with lots of regulators. That is the opposite of Hayekian capitalism. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Mark Littlewood of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Censorship is a key issue here, particularly for people on the right. Do you think it was addressed adequately? Definitely not. It was useful to name check Diamond and Silk. It was useful to check even politicians who had campaign ads that were shut down. But in every case, Zuckerberg was allowed to essentially dismiss the case and move on. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest. And, and Long awaited. It's been too long, Mark. It really has. Mark Littlewood of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, Mark, why have we failed? Because the, it seems to me that the arguments for free market capitalism, historically, um, theoretically, in every in every sense, they they work. They're proven to work. They are the they are the best way of allocating resources sure. fairly, successfully, efficiently. And yet, people like you and me, people like your boys and girls at the IEA, we're just outliers. We're freaks. Uh, even in the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. which ought to be leaping on our on our ideas and um, gratefully, thank thank God we've got we've got a chance of showing that we're not heartless, that we can actually make the world better and more prosperous. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it, are they? Sure. So uh, this is the great question and the one that really. Um, keeps me awake at night about what are we doing wrong because uh, I roughly agree with you that the uh, the climate of opinion has changed and is seeping towards a more socialist direction not a more 
classical liberal or free market direction. So what's gone wrong? I've been here at the IA for nearly a decade, and I'd like to think we you know, step up to the plate and put good rational arguments, but the point is to actually win those arguments, not merely to put them. I've got, I've got um, a few theories here. All of them raise problems. I'm not sure of the solutions. Uh, the first is we tend to be super rationalists. So we tend to say, you know, here is a diagram or a theory that explains the allocation of resources. Or compare on this sort of scattergram the um, increased GDP in countries that have tended to be capitalist over the past 30 years against countries that have tended to be socialist. We use rational logic to try and win uh, our arguments. And I am not saying that we should be illogical, and I'm not saying we should put forward any information which is untrue, but I think Jonathan Haidt, in his book, The Righteous Mind, suggests that you've got to kind of appeal to people's psychology and hearts as much as proving to them theories about allocations of resources. So perhaps we're somewhat robotic. Second issue is, really, people of a free market persuasion are offering not micro-solutions, but a meta-analysis. So free marketeers don't really have a view about whether, I don't know, sake of argument, Toys R Us goes bust and is replaced by Amazon as the main outlet for buying children's toys. Well, the market has done its business. Yeah. Uh, my view of whether I like my local branch of Toys R Us or not is neither here nor there. Uh, my view about whether people should work at Amazon's warehouse or in a department store is neither here nor there. Um, it's a little bit like people who argue you know, in favour of democracy. You don't necessarily have to have a view about what the outcome of an election should be in order to say that there should be elections. And free marketeers are a bit like that. So it's a more complex meta-analysis rather than pointing at a particular thing and saying, I don't like it, and here is a fix. And then the, the third problem is the sort of Bastiat uh, conundrum, the difference between the seen and the unseen, um, that if you spend a vast amount of state money on Project X. It's probably a very inefficient allocation of resources, but you get something at the end of it. If we complete HS2, for example, there oh will God, be God, a... No. Oh, and I hope not. I hope we won't, because it will be a colossal waste of £100 billion. Pounds. Yeah. But if we do complete HS2, you will be able to point, and its defenders will be able to point, at what I assume will be a nice, swanky train that goes really quickly. People don't really get into what else might have happened with that $100 billion yes. had we left it in the hands of taxpayers. You don't see the opportunity cost, whereas you see the thing. I mean, the, the London Olympics, a classic example of that. Uh, absolutely colossal waste of money. Yes. <laughs> um, we spent more on the London Olympics than we spent on prosecuting the Iraq war. I mean, uh, I'm not sure I was in favour of the Iraq war no, ever, no. But, 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 you know, but at least as a sort of war, you'd expect a, a vast amount of money. You get some bangs for your buck in a war. Yeah, yeah. Um, where, but the London Olympics, you can still sort of point at a list of heroic gold medalists and a big, nice stadium that's been given to West Ham United. There are things to point at. Whereas what else might the money have been spent on is a much harder argument to get across. You're absolutely right. I suppose the most perfect example of the seen and the unseen is, is the NHS. Mm -hmm. People revere the NHS because they conflate a statist, almost Stalinist, health, rationing healthcare system designed in the dog days after the war with... With healthcare, they, sure. the, the, the assumption is that either it's the NHS or people lying in the or streets, no or, or no, or no healthcare, and they don't think about the possibilities about what our healthcare system might be if we didn't have this rationing model. You're, you're absolutely right on that. I think the NHS is the is the kind of epitome of the of the difficulty of getting across an argument. Um, I mean, eventually, I think you can get there. I gather that back in the 1960s, when the IA was saying, surely to God, we should privatise the motor car industry. This is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Why do we have the government making cars badly? It would Why never work. Allow... And, but the reaction is sort of, what have you bastards got against motor cars? You know, why are yeah. you against cars? No, we're not against cars. And exactly the same things happening. Why do you hate the Mini? Why, why do you... I mean, you know, I'm highly sceptical. I'm deeply opposed to the NHS model. But the immediate response is, what have you got against healthcare? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and the... I think the NHS actually brings in even bigger problems in trying to explain the opportunity or the potential of a different system. Um, 
One is, if you receive suboptimal compared to what you might otherwise get in, say, you know, I don't know, in the Netherlands or in Switzerland, you receive some suboptimal healthcare, but you live. So I'll give you a live example. Uh, about 10 years ago, I had an absolutely catastrophic asthma attack. Uh, I was rushed to hospital by the paramedics. They were pumping me full of adrenaline in the back of the ambulance. Nip and tuck whether I was going to make it. I was in intensive care. And did you? And I did. <laughs> uh, I was in intensive care for three days. You know, uh, they told my parents overnight. They thought I was going to pull through, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, two days later, I'm not quite on my feet, but uh, awake and conscious. And a week later, I'm on my feet. Now, what's my immediate reaction here? My immediate reaction was to track down the paramedics and thank them, to thank the nurses for helping me, uh, to feel very blessed that I was alive. My immediate reaction was not to think through, although I did latterly do this. Did I only have an 82% chance of survival? And in fact, in Switzerland, I would have had a 94% chance yeah. of survival. You just don't think in those terms. So, I mean, I suppose rather flippantly, you could say the biggest complainants of the National Health Service are, are not here with us because their, their numbers didn't come up. But you don't... So I'm conscious myself, I psychologically didn't think that way. I didn't say, well, I'm glad you saved my life. But, you know, if only we'd had a better system of moving people from A to B in ambulances that was more marketized, my chances would have been higher. And then finally on healthcare, you don't tend to get comparisons. Uh, I mean, more and more you are, but it's, it's rare, I think, to find a Brit who said, well, I could compare my knee surgery in London with my knee surgery in Berlin. I have my left, left knee done by the National Health Service and my right knee done in, in Germany. And I have to say the knee surgery in Berlin was a lot, lot better. You tend, to, you tend to only consume healthcare and surgery where you live, yeah. not exclusively so. So it isn't sort of subject to quite the same competitive pressures that, um, that you might get elsewhere. I mean, I've got a theory that the reason that uh, restaurants and cuisine have improved so much in Britain and particularly in London in the last 25 years is because of foreign holidays. People were going abroad, sitting in a European restaurant, being charged a very modest fee, getting terrific food, returning back home to Blighty and thinking, why the hell am I putting up with crummy sort of microwave, badly cooked stuff here? And that's had a competitive pressure on improving British restaurants and cuisine. You don't really get that in healthcare. Yeah. You'll have some people who have an accident abroad or some healthcare abroad, but it's a rarity. You'll consume, I don't know, 95, 99% of your healthcare at home. So all of those problems on explaining markets are exacerbated in the case of the National Health Service. What's the solution uh, in terms of winning the argument, not in terms of what's the solution in improving the healthcare system? That's an easy question. What's the solution in terms of winning the argument? Well, I think, A, it's drip, drip, drip. I do think there is a case of just continually repeating things. I mean, every single time I see a bad story about the National Health Service anywhere, about, you know, somebody's died because of negligence or whatever, I just tweet it uh, and just write above it, envy of the world, continually yes, repeating this good. ridiculous mantra. And then the other thing, which um, I think we have made a bit of headway on at the IEA, we haven't turned the tank around, is actually just encouraging comparisons. Because for too long the debate has been... Uh, either the choices between the NHS and no healthcare, or uh, the slightly more sophisticated one has been the choices of the NHS or the American system. Totally binary. The only two countries on planet Earth are apparently the United Kingdom and the USA. An unbelievably Anglo-centric view of the world, if I may say. And I think we have now widened that to be able to say, well, let's just put aside the USA for a moment, uh, but let's look at the Dutch or the Swiss um, or even the Scandinavians. And at this point, you, nobody can really turn around and say, ah, but those are extreme right-wing capitalist countries, you know. Why would we ever want to be a bit more like Holland? Um, and that is starting to get a bit of traction. You know, are we really saying that we have cracked this problem, uh, that the NHS is the envy of the world and the rest of Europe, Johnny Foreigner, is so goddamn stupid yeah. that he hasn't bothered to replicate our system? Or might we be a bit more cosmopolitan and open-minded and accept that we've actually got a bit to learn from the Europeans as well as to teach them? And when you put that argument to a typical sort of metropolitan left-of-centre person, they don't quite know 
where to turn. So I'm essentially accusing people who will broker no argument over the National Health Service. I'm caricaturing them as little Englanders. Yes, good one. They'll, they'll love that. <laughs> I think, given that we're going to have an optimistic theme on this podcast, apparently, um, I am optimistic that, that we are going to increasingly do what you said uh, with restaurants. We are going to go abroad and, and get treatments abroad. The former Eastern, Eastern Europe countries, I think, particularly. I had, a, I had an email the other day from a guy in Bulgaria mm -hmm. who said to me, I hear you've got Lyme disease and uh, just you might give this, a, this some thought. It's a very expensive thing to treat, but we in Bulgaria can treat it more cheaply. For example, that blood test that costs you £1,200 from a German clinic, we, can, we in Bulgaria do for £500. Right. That kind of thing. I, I, know, I know, for example, that people are going to get their hair transplants now in sure. Turkey. Turkey is the stem cell is yep. going to become massive. There are chains opening across across the world. People may fly out to the Far East or wherever. So I'm confident that the markets, the thing that we, we both think mm -hmm. are a, a force for good, will ultimately drive out or at least reduce bad bad health care. So that's good. I, I, I'm sure you're right on that. There's lots of examples of this. There's dentistry, dentistry. Is another one where where sort of if you want um, cosmetic surgery and your teeth straightened or something, uh, I, I understand people are actually sort of rather than sort of going for surgery in the UK for an, an under the knife for sort of, you know, a, a, an evening, are taking a sort of 10 day, two week holiday in South Africa, of which the dental surgery, which is cheaper and of at least as good a quality is just an element, and the overall cost is lower. So you're right, the market will do its work. I just think in healthcare, because it's harder to get those competitive pressures, it takes more time than the dog and duck competing with the king's head on two corners totally. of the same street. Talking of which, did you see that extraordinary tweet by, a, I'm sure you did, by a Conservative MP in Scotland mm -hmm. uh, saying that he wanted to take action about the fact that petrol stations at different ends of his constituency were charging different yeah. prices for petrol. This is a conservative. But I, I did see that. It was absolutely extraordinary. Um, my reply to him was I was appalled that uh, my understanding was that I had to pay more for a pint of um, beer in London than his constituents had to pay for a pint of beer in his constituency. Yeah. So I wanted to know what legislation he was intending to bring forward in order to make sure that I could buy a pint of beer in a pub as cheaply as his constituents yeah. could. Uh, I mean, that, if you like, just sort of shows you the scale of the task. I've never met the, 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 the chap who posted this, but seems to just have zero understanding of the price mechanism. I mean, literally zero. Uh, and therefore defaults into the, I see this, surely it is an injustice rather than part of competition. I therefore want to regulate and ban any differences. The whole point of the price mechanism is not that there is a correct price to end at that some expert or even inexpert politician can discover. The point of the price mechanism is it is a permanent discovery process. And if I can make an absolute mint selling petrol to this guy's constituents, then intelligent people like you will work out that you're going to open a petrol station down the road and undercut me. And eventually those profits get whittled away as long as barriers to entry are relatively thin. So, my God, what an educational job we've got to do explaining to people what the price mechanism is, why prices might be different in one retail outlet compared to another. Absolute ABC economics. So definitely the, the politicians who should be supporting it, who, who should be making a case for free markets are not doing so. They're, they're effectively propping up crony capitalism and, st and statism, even in the Conservative Party. But going back to what you said about uh, people being less receptive to conservative ideas. I was given hope by watching a, a few um, performances by Jacob Rees-Mogg on Question Time, which I, which I consider beyond the pale. I can't bear to watch it. It annoys me too much. But Jacob Rees-Mogg is that very, very rare thing among conservative MPs. When he's asked a, a, a question which requires a hard economic argument, 
answer. He never goes for the easy feel good answer. He goes for the for the one that sure. you or I would give. And the audiences are often receptive to them. They they applaud him. I agree with that um, with regard to Jacob. And it's, um, uh, I guess, a bit of an oddity to say of Jacob Rees-Mogg that he's a very modern politician. <laughs> People would caricature him as the opposite. He's sort of jokingly called the Member of Parliament from the 18th century. But you are right to say that I think straight answers are applauded. And the idea... That, that I fear a lot of people who might otherwise be assumed to be in favour of free markets, you mentioned the Conservative Party, fall into, is sort of capitalism is as good as far as it goes, but. but it doesn't really go that far. And therefore, we should probably engage in more and more price fixing. All sorts of different points. I think with our minimum wage legislation now, we are fixing the price of labour for 20 25% of the workforce. You know, the more you increase the minimum wage, the more that will be true. We, we need to price fix for uh, electricity. Um, this uh, Tory MP wants to price fix for a law that in your constituency <laughs> petrol needs to be sold at a set. Um, very worrying. And actually, you need to sort of rediscover the basics. I've been particularly disappointed um, a year or so ago, I think this was, with both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor in different speeches. Um, I think it was the Prime Minister's Bank of England. I think she was speaking at the Bank of England. And you you hear or read the sort of first paragraph or the first substantial paragraph saying, we need to make again the case for free market capitalism. We need to get back to basics and make that case again. It is important that we stand up for free markets and capitalism. But then does not make the case. Then segues immediately into... That is why I am unveiling today the biggest state house building program since the 1950s. Or that is why we are going to fix the price of electricity. It's absolutely extraordinary. I'm not such a purist that I would say there is never any intervention that you should have in the marketplace or that there is no role for government. But those who are perhaps taking the basics of free market capitalism for granted and saying we need to restate the case are not restating the case. They are just restating that we need to restate the case, and that's not very helpful. These points also are quite sometimes quite tricky to grasp. I, I was thinking about the minimum wage. My daughter, I took her home for the weekend with one of her school friends, and they were asking me for counter-arguments for their lefty teachers, mm -hmm. because, of course, even at private schools the teachers are all bloody leftists mm. you know. so we were talking about about thatcher and the coal miners for example and i mm. said that more coal mines were closed under labor than under mm -hmm. conservatives and we were talking about the minimum wage yep. and i explained to her something that probably had not been taught by her teacher at all but you, you get this from thomas Sowell and, and, and so forth which is that a minimum wage is a tax on labor it makes labor more expensive more unattractive to to businesses so if you like people and you like people to have jobs, then the last thing you want to be doing is campaigning for a minimum wage, superficially attractive though it might be, because what you're doing is pricing labor out of the market and encourage incentivizing business owners yep. to, to mechanize. To Sure. Uh, that's exactly right. And this, this you picked on, an, uh, along with the National Health Service earlier, another really tricky one for us, because... You start at the outset, if you raise scepticism about or even call for the abolition of the minimum wage, the sort of starting assumption is that you are uh, an evil, bastard, exploitative sort of, uh, you know, Dickensian overlord who wants to go back to the workhouses. That's yeah. the sort of starting point, yeah. which you then have got two or three minutes to try and turn around. Uh, the... I mean, my argument would be this. I've got two that I try and use against it. So I forget what the prevailing rate of the minimum wage is now because it's being you know, hyped up yeah. to, uh, and there's all sorts of different bands. But, but let's say for sake of argument that we're going to move towards, and we seem to be edging that, a £10 an hour minimum wage. We're, we're not there yet uh, by, by a long shot, but that's, that's sort of the direction of travel. We are saying, are we, that if you wish to sell your labour at £9.99 pence per hour, and your putative employer agrees that you are worth that, but not a penny more. We are saying that the government and the state should make that transaction illegal. 
That is what we are saying. That yes. is the argument. I wish to go and do this work. I honestly believe my value to the company is £9.99 per hour. The minimum wage is £10. The employer says, you are just worth £9.99, but not a penny more. That job does not happen. That person remains unemployed or uh, has to go and do something that they might be potentially better at but don't want to do. Um, so that, that, that would be sort of argument A. I mean, do you really want the government to prohibit those, those transactions? Argument B, I quite like slippery slope arguments. Uh, when are we going to actually compare people who might be working below the prevailing minimum wage to voluntary work? Um, so my father, for example, I mean, he's affluent, fairly middle class affluent, not stinking rich or anything, retired and has occupied himself with a number of sort of good deeds, um, helping out with the lighting at the local theatre in his town, helping do the accounts for a local charity that helps people get off drugs, these sort of things. No, he doesn't need to be paid the minimum wage, but why is he doing this for zero? I mean, if, it, if it's not acceptable to pay people £6.50 an hour, it's surely to God wholly unacceptable to pay them naught pounds an hour. Yeah. So how are we going to distinguish between voluntary work and paid work? And you might, oddly enough, get too much of a growth in the naught pounds an hour stuff. I mean, to give you an example at the, the IEA, with all of this, all interns must be paid. I mean, without crunching all the numbers, but I'm sort of genuinely in the sort of position where one might be minded to say to some of our interns here, look, there's no way we're going to pay you the minimum wage. But, you know, we might be able to help with giving you two or three quid an hour, four quid an hour, um, just to sort of, you know, help you buy a little bit. I mean, it might still be that that's adding to your debt that isn't even covering your cost, but it's better than naught. But I can't do that. My choice is naught or the minimum yes. wage. Yeah. So they get naught. Actually as, it, actually, as it happens, I think we should be charging them. Uh, if you become an intern at the IEA, it helps your career. Uh, when I was at university, I don't remember submitting a bill for staying up late and writing an essay, even if I was doing a lot of work. Uh, it was the other way around. Yes. I was paying Oxford University. Um, I certainly wasn't sort of, there's my essay and here's my invoice yeah. for the 10 hours that I've spent that's, on it. That's true. And you're, you're right, the slippery slope argument it extends towards this view abroad that housewives and sort of family carers are being exploited and sure. this injustice needs to be remedied by yeah. state intervention. Now, how much is that going to cost? Yeah, no, exactly. Well, Extraordinary. Uh, I mean, that really is the sort of measure of uh, how far the state wish to inveigle themselves uh, into our lives. And I think it goes back to what we would fairly count as a voluntary action and, and to keep picking cases that are voluntary. I mean a family arrangement whereby one spouse stays at home and the other works, for example, and to ask whether that really is a scenario in which the state should regulate things. I mean, or if, you know, uh, if, if my missus goes off and does the shopping, you know, does she come back and say, well, that, that took me 90 minutes while you sat down and watched television. Uh, 90 minutes at the minimum wage rate is... You know, twelve pounds fifty. Give me twelve pounds fifty to be doing the show. Mind you, do, do, you, I'm sure it's the same in every single marriage. Sort of competitive martyrdom. That look, I did this, and yeah, and, and look, my suffering was much greater than yours when I went and took out the bins. No, and you're <laughs> absolutely right on that, James. But the key thing is that you set your own price mechanism within your marriage. It is not set by the state. You do not have the bin regulator uh, coming in to say, "Oh, well, each bin that you carry, you know, out to the out to the rubbish." is 50p and each time your wife does the washing up it's five pounds so you do have those trade-offs they don't typically involve money or they could if you wish to inject that into one's relationship yeah. but the key thing is they're voluntary yeah yeah you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me james Dellingpole, and my very special guest mark littlewood of the institute of economic affairs <laughs> right part news tonight with joel pollock and rebecca Mansour. i said that it's the epitome of hypocrisy Unless you fall in line with their liberal agenda, this uniparty globalist liberal agenda, they will never support you. They, they, they use the whole gender issue, of course, as some kind of tool to prop up their, their messaging, but it's the phoniest thing. Sirius XM Patriot, Channel 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. 
Welcome back to the Daily Report podcast with me, James Daily Report, and my very special guest, Mark Littlewood. Now, Mark, I, I, I was quite taken aback by the American football thing. Actually, just tell me about that first. Why should I care about American football? Isn't it very sort of stop-starty? And, and It is very stop-starty, that's true. It is not. It does not have the uh, beauty of the free-flowing nature of, of, of uh, association football. But it, it is an amazing game. I mean, the best way of describing it is basically chess on steroids. So the chess pieces of the various players on the, the pitch, the, the decisions about what to do and where to move are essentially made by the coach on the sidelines who is communicating that information directly into the headsets oh. of the players who are therefore actors being directed on the stage. And the, uh, the key aim is which coach basically outwits the other. Um, so to that extent, it's like chess. You know, if I move my knight here, are you going to move your bishop there to counter check it? And you're trying to get to checkmate, but with real living human beings in which you simply need to outwit your opponent. It's fantastic to watch. Um, if It does take a good couple of years to understand all of the unbelievably complex rules. Yeah, so what made you do it? Because, uh, I mean, wasn't it... Like, like when I, was, I remember when I was trying to get into drum and bass, mm. and it took me a good week before I started like, but, I, but I knew that one had to get into drum and bass because it sure. was going to be a thing but why would one as an Englishman why would one want to be interested in American football um, well this explains a vice of mine um, I mean I, I'm generally quite interested in sports and, and games and like having a hinterland but uh, I play a lot of poker in Las Vegas oh, do and you in order to <gasps> be a, uh, a mildly good I'm not an excellent poker player but I'm just about win at the low stakes in Las Vegas. A key thing about being a poker player is do not play too many hands. You should be throwing 80% of your hands into the junk without betting. And it probably takes a good minute or so to play a hand at a live table. So you're spending most of your time just throwing away your cards. All Las Vegas poker rooms have lots of televisions showing sport. So if you are spending... 80, 90% of your time at the poker table simply throwing your cards in the muck and wanting some distraction, you start watching the sports. And so I started watching both baseball and American football uh, in order to make sure that I wasn't getting my entertainment from betting on poker hands that I should not be playing. And, and, and how does baseball, you haven't mentioned that is, that, is that good? I like it a lot. I mean, everybody says it's just sort of an American version of rounders. Uh, I think it's... It's really the American version of cricket. Um, it's a bit like American football. You could say it's stop-start, and a single game does take quite a long time to play, you know, sometimes uh, three hours or so, but that hardly compares with test cricket. Um, and again, you're trying to outfox each other. I mean, it's, it's great eye candy. I'm not totally sure I would sit down and be glued to every single play in a baseball game. I've been to quite a few live baseball games, and it's a little bit like cricket. You'll, you know, get yourself a beer and some popcorn, sit down, and then have a wander around the stadium. And if it starts to look exciting, then come back and watch a bit. So that's sort of how I got into American sports. Right. Have you seen the new souped-up cricket that in the in the brightly coloured outfits and stuff that yeah. they play in the West Indies and elsewhere? Cricket is a game that I've never actually quite understood. Uh, in this, I mean, is it I, because you're an oik? It is because I am an oik. That I think that is entirely fair, actually. All of my sporting preferences are deeply working class. Um, uh, Formula One, uh, football, uh, rugby and cricket, I don't pretend to understand. So it's, it's either because I'm an oik or it's because I'm a kind of mockney and uh, trying to establish and prove my working class roots yeah. the, uh, in virtue of the sports that I follow. Well, I, I know that you support an obscure football team called Southampton. Yes, that is true. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're kind of... Are they are they, what's it, are they in the Premier League or not? They are in the Premier oh, League. Oh, sorry. So, so that doesn't mean that they're not obscure. I mean, I do, yep. I do, I do support a, um, a football team that basically never wins anything. Um, uh, it's a form of uh, masochism, essentially. Uh, being in and staying in the Premier League is pretty much the height of Southampton Football Club's ambitions. Can I tell you my dark secret? Um, my dark secret is that even when I was a kid, I I felt I had to have a football team mm -hmm. to stop, you know, so so that people are ask what your favourite football team is. You don't, don't say, I haven't got one, because that no. would be stupid, wouldn't it? you get bullied. Um, 
And so my football team was always the Wolves. Right. Because that's my uncle's favourite. My uncle's a football fan. Right, my dad, my, my dad wasn't. So I've always been a Wolves supporter, just but without paying attention to the results particularly. Yep. And as I understand it, just recently, the Wolves has become this amazingly successful team. They using... are back in the Premier League and playing brilliantly well. And will stay up, I think, yeah, almost Be- certainly. Because is that because they've just bought some expensive... How did it happen? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it... I mean, uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers are um, one of what you sort of categorise as a yo-yo team. They, they're they not always going to be in the Premier League. Their probable natural position is somewhere around the top 20 teams, but certainly in the top sort of 40 or so teams. So are they going to be in the top division? Are they going to be in the, what used to be called the second division? They're always going to be sort of straddling that, a little bit like Southampton, to be honest. Um, but money goes a long way, and they've invested in their team and their stadium heavily. Um, and although we've only just started the football season, of the teams that have been promoted into the Premier League, they definitely look like the strongest. And very few pundits think that they are going to uh, be relegated this season. Right. Well, what about was it was it Leicester the team that that yep. won the? Uh, it was a five thousand to one shot. They uh, won the the Premier League game. When was it? Twenty fifteen. Five thousand to one at the start of the season. I mean, an absolutely. I mean, PhDs need to be written on how. Has that been made into a movie yet? Uh, it is being made into oh, a I'll movie. Bet it is. That'd be, that'd uh, be a good film. I'd watch yeah. that. And, but it's one of those sort of, you know, you couldn't make it up sort of thing. If you made it as a movie without it happening, it would be considered utterly, utterly preposterous. And Leicester City themselves were not in any way um, geared to that even being anything like a, a reasonable aspiration. In fact, their um, key star players, Jamie Vardy, for example, their, their excellent centre forward, were all on bonuses at the end of the season, which they could collect if Leicester were not relegated. There were no bonuses on you get a payout if we win the league. It was considered that the height of their ambitions was simply (laughs) not finish 18th, 19th or 20th that would get you relegated. And if they could escape the jaws of relegation, they would give... They would give the the playing staff bonuses, but uh, I mean, that will something like that will almost certainly never happen in our lifetime again. Five thousand to one was probably the appropriate odds, so it will happen about one season in five thousand. Okay, so so Jamie Vardy was is he now a, a, a more valuable player? Or he what? is a more valuable. He's actually chosen to stay at Leicester City. He still plays for Leicester City. Leicester have not reached those heights again, but are probably now an established Premier League club, one of maybe the top ten. Um, uh, he's actually just retired from England, but he got himself into the England team. Yeah, I mean, he he would have done very nicely. Thank you from it. Uh, Riyad Mahrez, who was probably equally important, possibly even more important to their uh, Premier League winning team, uh, has shuffled off to Manchester City, where oh. he will be making colossal sums of money. So really, in most cases, although Vardy is an exception, playing spectacularly well for a lower or middle ranking team is your ticket to get into a top-ranking team. And you have a theory, I understand, that, which is that footballers aren't um, overpaid. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest they're overpaid at all. What they have been brilliantly successful at is ensuring that they receive the full fruits of their labour. So right back in the day, you used to actually have a maximum wage for footballers. Did you really? Um, and that, of course, meant that if football or the team were colossally successful there were super normal profits going to the owners because I was putting the Manchester United team on the pitch. Their wages were capped. If loads of people were coming through the gates buying gate receipts, well, who got the big slice of the money? Uh, The evil capitalist bosses who own Manchester United Football Club, not the poor working class people who were turning out and actually scoring the goals. It was down to Jimmy Hill, actually, who was the head of the Professional Footballers Association at the time, went on to become a very famous um, broadcaster, uh, for the BBC, God rest his soul, who managed to get the maximum wage scrapped. So there is no cap on what you can pay players anymore. And they have been spectacularly successful on getting their wages up and up and up. Bobby Moore, who was the England World Cup winning captain in 1966, his first job as a footballer, he was paid in today's money, in today's money, £14,000 per annum. And this was a guy who went on to be quite 
almost certainly in the best England team of all time if you draw up the top 11 now, and quite possibly in the world's best 11. 14 grand a year in today's <laughs> money was his starting point. Um, you can now earn as um, a decent player, even if you're playing for Southampton, um, 60 or 70,000 pounds a week. A week. Oh um, my God. To play for Southampton Football Club. And if to you lose are, every week. Uh, we're, not, we're not quite every that. Every week. To be <laughs> really the worst football team in the world. Uh, you know, we're sort of, I think we're 13th in the Premier League. Oh, uh, that's all right. And it will be similar at Wolves or, uh, um, uh, or, or another team. Oh, I think I want, I want or, to watch Wolves beat you um, now. I'm, I'm suddenly all excited. Sort of, well, those sort of clubs where if you're playing for one of the very top teams, you could well be on £200,000 a week. Um, uh, this is a hugely successful movement by the workers. Uh, it is nearly impossible for the capitalist bosses to make a profit in football anymore because it is almost a perfect competitive model. In fact, the, the ratio uh, the, um, between the cost of your playing staff, your, your footballers on the pitch, and your results is almost, one to, you know, is almost a perfect correlation. So there's almost a perfect correlation between what you are paying your players and the number of points and wins and losses you will get each season. It's a perfect market. And the, I would have thought the joy of it to, to those on the left is it's been a colossally successful trade union movement. It is the workers, many, most, who are from you know, fairly standard or working class backgrounds who are getting rich. It should bring a tear to the eye. And it's the bosses who are losing money hand over fist to subsidising these enterprises. You don't get rich by owning a football team. In fact, well, the great motto is, what's the best way in England to become a millionaire? Uh, the answer is to start as a billionaire and buy a football team. Yes. Well, as a parent parenthesis there, because uh, I'm, I'm actually really enjoying you talking about sport because no one talks about sport because I don't let them on, on the <laughs> show. But it, it is interesting, isn't it? Every now and again, the mail and similar newspapers will run an article saying how disgusting it is that these vile jobs are hideously overpaid and what kind of example does it set when hard-working nurses only get peanuts and yada 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 and i was thinking that is the classic example of the problem that we free marketeers have that even conservative newspapers find it more seductive to make these cheap kind of the world's falling apart hysteria sure. sh cheap shots than they do to say look good on you yeah. Good on you guys. This is this is the market working, and and actually, good luck to them. I, I, I wholly agree with that. That the mistake in some of this sort of coverage about sort of why should you know Southampton centre forward earn in a week, whatever it would be, twice or three times what a nurse earns in a year, isn't this terrible? Being a nurse is more important than being centre forward for Southampton Football Club. Uh, uh, is riddled with a misunderstanding of how the market is supposed to work. You are not paid on the basis of what you're doing being important. You're paid on it being valued and a unique skill. So uh, for all of your jokes about how terrible Southampton Football Club are, <laughs> the, the, the truth of the matter is there are very, very, very few people who are competent enough footballers to be able to play for Southampton Football Club. I mean, a tiny, tiny fraction. What, not even me? Uh, I don't think you quite make it, although we are, you, you know, you're kind of slender and, you know, we, we are looking for a new right back. So, you know, maybe you should polish your boots. I quite like being defence, actually. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, well, there you go. Drop it, drop them a CV. Okay. Uh, every time the manager position comes vacant, I always apply for the job. Uh, <laughs> I've, so far been, I've so far been unsuccessful, given the only um, evidence I can pray in my aid is that I'm pretty good at the computer game championship manager, but that hasn't got me an interview yet. Um, but, but look, what you're paid for is not whether what you're doing is important, and clearly being you know, a nurse or a doctor is important. It's how unique the skill is. It's also not whether you're hardworking. It's how productive you are. And I get annoyed at the sort of this cliche of hard-working families. Look, I'm not trying to suggest that everybody in Britain is lazy. But the truth of the matter is we work fewer hours than our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation. Uh, why should you be paid for being hard-working? You might be hard-working but highly ineffective. And why is it always the sort of either the soft, cuddly professions, like being a nurse, or the slightly manly and heroic professions like being a firefighter that are singled out. I mean, what about sewage workers? I mean, having clean running water 
I would say is pretty much a necessity in society. But I never hear anybody saying, well, you know, it's nice to have a nurse to patch me up, but really more important is that I have clean running drinking water coming into my flat. And clearly having clean running drinking water coming into my flat is more important than whether my football team wins a game of football. Therefore, sewage workers and sanitation staff should be paid more than Ronaldo or Lukaku or some such like. The the prize mechanism is there to, to reflect talent that is valued. And it, 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 the, these numbers are only going up because mugs like me pay a fortune to watch football. And, and it's not so much going through the gate receipts anymore. It is that the English Premier League is one of our most fantastically successful exports. I think I was told that the Man United Man City match last season, the top of the table clash, was watched by one billion people across planet Earth. And in the era of modern television, these people are paying for it. I mean, I pay Sky Sports a lot of money. To, yes. To watch that, uh, but even in you know in in uh, poorer countries, people will still be throwing in a dollar or two or whatever it might be to watch that game, and they're watching that game because of the quality of the twenty-two men on the pitch. Those guys get very rich, you know. To be honest, they're not paid obviously more than top pop stars. Um, so you know, if Elton John or Madonna or whoever else can sell out Wembley Arena or Wembley Stadium or go on a world tour. Uh, charging $150 a ticket or more, and people are flocking in to see them, they make a ton of money. Football is no different, and there is no reason why these people should be paid less than superstars in other forms of entertainment, be that pop stars, be that top-selling authors, um, and good luck to them, I say. Why should J.K. Rowling be extremely rich because she writes book about, books about a fictitious child wizard? Um, isn't it, why is that? Why shouldn't she go and become a nurse instead? Is that more important? Well, the judgment of the marketplace is loads of people love the joy of reading her books, and the judgment of the marketplace in football is large numbers of people like the joy, or in my case, the agony of uh, watching players in our strip kick a spherical piece of leather around a pitch. Yes, um, I like the idea, by the way, of J.K. Rowling. Um, going off to become a nurse, it might it might mean she's got less time to spend whinging about stuff on on Twitter, which would be a well. The other great the, the other great line I love about um, people getting rich is oftentimes businessmen are sort of told, well you you seem to have made your first sort of ten million pounds you know why don't you just retire now you know why are you trying to make another ten million or another hundred million nobody ever says to an author why have you bothered writing a third book I mean your first two books sold enough. Uh, You're now rich. Why write seven Harry Potter books? Why not stop at two? So it's strange the way that we encourage sort of more effort, productivity and output in one area of the economy. Let's say, you know, making films, releasing songs or writing books, but seem to have an antipathy to it if it's a sort of straightforward bricks and mortar business and you're trying to increase your personal fortune from 100 million to 200 million. That seems legitimate if you are a pop star or the author of books about a child wizard, but not legitimate if you're a manufacturer. But also, manufacturer. also I can speak from, um, from personal knowledge here, a member of my family. Um, people who are entrepreneurs actually don't, often don't give a, a, a damn about the money. The, mm-hmm. the money is merely a measure of their success, a gauge of their success, but they don't know how to spend it. Sure. They're much more interested in building a successful business in the same way that were I to write another book, I, I would be asking myself, how can I write the best book sure. that's going to appeal to the most people while simultaneously re- remaining true to my principles? Yeah. And my st- business people are the same. They don't, money is just a, a thing. It's not, a, it's not the main aim. You're, you're absolutely right on that. And it's also pretty much the only route to success. I was talking a couple of years ago to someone who runs uh, an agency basically trying to match up um, angel investors with budding entrepreneurs, a very noble thing to do. And she was telling me that uh, she can sort of tell whether the entrepreneur has a chance of making it by asking them what they want to do. And anyone who turns around and says, well, you know, I really want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. Yeah. Uh, and I really want to make the biggest profit I can and live in a big house. I'm never going to make it. The ones who make it are the ones who say, I've got a fantastic idea on how to improve coffee machines or lawnmowers or whatever it might be. Uh, And they're impassioned about the idea. And the money is simply reaping the reward of a good idea that other people like. You cannot just set out to make 10 or 100 million pounds 
I mean, that might be in the back of your mind something that you would like, but the way you get there is to do things and to come up with things and to change things in a way that the human population at large applauds. And they don't just applaud, they buy it. It is a yeah. revealed preference. That is how you get rich, essentially, to be one of the purest forms of public servant. I'm so glad you got the phrase revealed preference in because I only learned it recently from from um, from, from Christian. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, for being a great podcast guest. And I think this I think we're going to definitely have you back because there's, we've got so much more to talk about. And you've only scratched the surface we've, of Southampton Football Club. In, there's indeed. much, much more to talk I, about. There. I was about to say that I, I, I felt rather bad about not having um, mined that particular scene <laughs> as thoroughly as I'd. But next time, eh? Um, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Mark Little. Wood, Southampton fan and um, director of the Ec- Institute of Economic Affairs. Thank you and goodbye. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. I want to actually take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip hop. And then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Ray Kwan said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents his wealth, his achievement, capitalism. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.